Yeah. So hi everyone. Um, so yeah, let's try not to sleep too much during this talk, please. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, the all winner resources and especially what we did um, to support them in the mainline kernel. Uh, you'll see that obviously all winners, since they are mostly targeted at Android, uh, provided some Linux kernel working already, but it was quite far from the mainline quality um, in several ways that we are going to see. Um, and so with a few of the people, we actually started mainlining this a uh, bit less than two years ago. Um, and we ended up, well, and we are actually going on with this effort because it's not done yet, but we made some good progress that we are going to detail. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm Maxim. Uh, I work at Free Electrons, where I am an, uh, an embedded Linux engineer and trainer. So we do training for Android and Linux as a whole. So we have some trainings for drivers uh, and everything, but it's also part of our day job. So we are also Linux developers. Um, and as such, I'm the maintainer of, uh, well, the all-winner resources, obviously, and I made some various contributions to other embedded toolings. Um, yeah. um, so, I've been talking a bit about all-winner, but what is all-winner? So, all-winner is a Chinese SOC vendor um, that is based in Zhuhai, so which is just near Hong Kong, but in the mainline, uh, mainland China. Um, and they basically only did ARM uh, SOCs, so they had like a very old uh, ARM9 based design um, when they first started in 2007, so it's kind of a new vendor, like a young one. Um, and then now I've been switching to doing multimedia SOCs, um, so it's SOCs that you will find in every cheap tablets and phones you might find from, I don't know, uh, um, Best Buy in the US or Lafnac in France or something like that. All these cheap tablets have most likely an all-winner SOCs or some equivalent from another vendor. Um, and in just seven years, uh, they've been able to take um, a nice market share in the tablet space. Um, so it's 15% in 2013, so behind Apple, but it's basically the only other vendor that is um, in front of them in the, in the market. Um, why is that? Um, because most of the time we know the big players here, so you probably all have heard about TI, Samsung and everything, and whenever you are buying a tablet with it, well, you notice that it's an NVIDIA or TI1, but you won't notice the suck in some cheap tablets you will buy at 50 euros. Um, and so, yeah, it's most likely an all-winner one. It can be a wrap chip one as well, uh, which is another old Chinese uh, SOC vendor, but it's mostly the two key players in the low-end market. And so they have a lineup that is quite huge now. Uh, so they have the F-series that are the old ARM9-based one, which are not spotted in the kernel. Um, you can't even find any hardware for it. Uh, it didn't even run Linux in the first place. So it's, yeah, we don't know much about this one. Um, and actually, the first one to be really uh, supported and seen in the wild uh, have been the um, A10 and its derivative, so which are A10, A10S, A13 mostly, um, so which have been Cortex-A8 based, so it was a single uh, CPU SOC, uh, which was very cheap, um, and they made some derivative until they started to use a multi-core CPU, uh, a multi-CPU design, which was the A20, but Basically, the A20 is just the A10 and the switch, the CPUs to uh, dual Cortex A7, and that's, and that's it. So it was kind of trivial to support as well. Um, and then they switched to a very new generation of SOC, where a lot of controllers and everything changed uh, with the A31, and they went on with this generation with the A23 and A33, A3, where basically, they also switched from GPUs, for example. Um, they were using the Mali one from ARM um, in the first ones. Uh, they switched to a power VR from Imagination. Um, and so it's, yeah, dual quad Cortex AS7 uh, SOCs. So it's, they are quite beefy and you can do a lot, a lot with them. Um, 
And yeah, and finally, there's the AIT, which is the latest one, which is a big little one. So it's, I don't know if you know about big little, but it's like a concept introduced by ARM, where they mixed uh, very powerful CPUs with very power efficient CPUs uh, running at different frequency and everything. So it's um, not uh, symmetrical multiprocessing like it's usual, um, but it, Really, the CPUs are running at different frequency and have different processing capabilities, so you have to take that into account. Um, and yeah, so they have a new SOC that is, um, yeah, starting to, to ship. Um, and so one thing that is interesting with these multimedia SOCs is that they have very strong development boards availability. Um, there's a few vendors that are providing really good boards, um, which are really development boards. So you have all the pin headers and most of the signals available directly on the on the system. So it's very easily, uh, well, very easy to use to do some hardware and low-level development. So among them, you will find Limex, which is based in Bulgaria. So it's even in the European Union, so it's quite easy to, to source and to buy. Um, and you have the QB boards as well, um, which are probably the most famous of these boards, but are kind of uh, declining now because the guy who founded QB boards left like a year ago or something like that. And so, yeah, it, they don't do as good boards as they used to. Um, so, yeah, so it looks like that. Um, so you have an Olimax board on top and a QB board um, beneath. Um, so it's very cheap. So, for example, the QB board that is there um, has a dual CPU based SOC, um, SATA, gigabit Ethernet, and everything. And it costs, um, I think it's around 40 euros, uh, shipping fee included. So it's like very cheap. Uh, and the one on top is this one based on a single core SOC, but ships for like 30 euros or something like that. So it's very convenient to, 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 to buy because it's, yeah, very cheap. Um, and so with these boards, usually we had the all winner kernel that was shipped, um, because they had to run Android. Um, and so the all winner kernel, um, was based mostly on two kernel version. Um, the first one was a Linux 3.0, uh, for the first generation SOC with a single CPU. Um, the next generations were based on a 3.3 or 3.4 for the, for the latest uh, kernel. Um, and it's basically just like every vendor code. Um, it's kind of full of hacks and everything. Uh, they don't care about mainlining at all. So it's just, you just have like a huge diff stat uh, whenever you compare it to a real uh, from the kernel.org kernel. Um, and they don't care much about the other resources because they just care about their own. Uh, so you had like a lot of shortcuts in, this, in the code every, everywhere. So it's not very, um, by today's standards at least, it's not very nice. But if you look at it from like a kernel that was around this time frame, so from 3.0 and everything, it, it's not very different from any vendor code. I mean, it's not very clean, but it's, yeah, kind of okay. Um, the thing is, uh, they never updated this kernel. Um, so they have like still a uh, Linux 3.3 or Linux 3.4 kernel. So it's very ancient by now. Um, and they don't use at all any of the subsystems and features that have been added, uh, ever since for the, especially for the ARM associates. Like uh, they don't use the command clock framework to handle the clocks in your system. They don't use DMA engine for the DMA transfers and everything. So that there's basically no consolidation at all in the source code, you just have like their own private API uh, and that's it. So it's kind of tricky even to port it to this, um, to these new systems. And you don't have the choice anywhere. You're stuck with it because all we know just give you this. Um, but it's, all of this is basically just usual vendor thing. Uh, it's nothing really out of what you can see, for example, with a vendor kernel from Freescale or TI, it's pretty common. The thing which is pretty uncommon, actually, is FEX. And FEX, actually, um, is something that 
a winner came up with um, that is binary file that is passed to the kernel at the time, which is compiled from a text-based file, which is readable by a human because um, it's supposed to be written by a human and then compiled and passed to the kernel. Um, and so the thing that FEX does is basically tells to the kernel which device are enabled uh, with what mixing of the clock frequencies, the clock time, the memory timings, and everything. So everything about the hardware itself, um, the regulator voltages, and everything. So it basically just looks like that. Uh, so you have a list of sections. Oh yeah, one thing I forgot to tell you is that it's using the Windows RNA syntax, um, like m most of you probably are familiar with. Um, and so you have a list of sections here, uh, just here, um, for example, which says, for example, that the, yeah, the first IPC controller is enabled uh, with a TWI used. And then for each pin uh, that might be used by this controller, to which outer pin on the SOC it's routed with some parameters um, that are used. And you have like a huge list of these ones. Uh, for example, for the MMCs, and you have another one for the display, for the SATA, and everything. Um, and so, the idea is you write that to match what you did on your order, um, and then you pass it to some compiler, uh, which is called FEXC, uh, which will compile it to a binary file. Your bootloader will load this binary file, load the kernel, boot the kernel, and the kernel will be able to read this file, and have the data it needs to be to be able to run. Um, the thing is, it should be, if you already did some ARM development, you should be very familiar with the device tree concept, which is very familiar to this one. Um, basically, the device tree is a solution to, that was used previously on the PowerPC and has been used by the ARM platforms for like three years now. Um, and it's Basically the same thing. You have a text file where you describe the hardware content, and then you pass, you compile it to some binary format. You pass this binary to the kernel, and the kernel uses that binary to, well, know where it's running on. Um, the thing is, with the device tree, the, the Linux implementation actually instantiates every device from the device tree. And so you have the information that is created from this data, this data file, and in fact, uh, it's actually the other way around. So every driver will be get probed, and then they will look into the fax file, for example. So in this case, the I square C driver will be loaded, and it will look into the fax file to know if it's allowed to probe, and if not, will exit, and otherwise will just continue its life. So it's kind of backwards, um, which causes some issues that we are going to see. Um, and so, yeah, so. It has some advantages, uh, the main ones being that since all the hardware-specific information is in a separate file, you can have a very uh, generic uh, kernel image. Um, so it allows to have a single kernel image for every board out there and just have a different binary file that will be best, and it's working. Um, and it's... <laughs> Allowing to have a very short um, time to boot, even if you don't know Linux at all, you don't have to do any driver development because you just have to write this file, and that's it. Um, so it's basically all the things that are nice with the device tree. Um, um, it has some disadvantages as well. Uh, the main one being that it's completely non-standard, even between all winner releases, the syntax might change and everything, so it's kind of a mess to that regard. Um, it only works for a single platform, um, the own winner one. Um, and it's very not generic enough because, like I was saying, uh, here it will be the I square C driver that will come and look to see if it's allowed to probe. But on a multi target system, um, what I square C driver is, a, is allowed to probe? You might have several I square C driver in your system. Uh, for example, uh, you might have the Marvel one and the All Winner one. Which one should probe in this case? You have no idea. So it's working very well, but it's basically just not generic enough. Um, except for some guy that you might have heard of, um, which started a huge flame war some time ago. Um, 
like a year ago or something. And the guy had an agenda where he was saying basically that, hey, you're the kernel maintainers, um, and you should apologize to a winner because you didn't pick their solution. Um, and by the way, device three is crap. Um, and so things heated up, as you might imagine. Um, and during the during the exchange of mails, um, he said some very true things, like um, the fact that the script that affects um, work very well, so it's allowing to have a very generic image for a winner and to ship it very easily. And that that's true, actually. Um, and that's something that we should really aim for for device trees, and we are coming there. Um, but at some point in the discussion, some guy said, OK, now I have a QB ball that I introduced previously, and I have some I square C pins that are exposed. And on these pins, I want to load a PCA 9532, which is a GPIO expander, if I remember correctly. Um, so I have some device that I want to put on my header. How do I do is fix? And then the guy said, well, you're out of the target market. So basically, you have either this hardware or, well, you're not supported by fix. So which is exactly why we can't use it in the kernel. Um, but yeah, it fits our solution. Um, so it's something that we had to go away from. Uh, we had to replace FX by the DT as part of the mainline process. Um, and we had some nice solution to do that as well. Um, and finally, they had like kind of a bit of, well, yeah, quite old boot process as well. Um, in the sense that you might choose between all winners boot process, which had, uh, which is in blue here, um, so which was based on their own boot order, which was which were called boot zero and boot one. Um, boot zero being in charge of doing the lower level initialization, um, then boot one doing all the all the rest. Um, and actually, you could have started the Linux kernel from there, um, but they chose to load uBoot instead, which was after that, in charge of loading the kernel, so which is a bit odd. And you had the solution from the community that already started, um, which had replaced all this by the U-boot directly, um, and some components that is compiled from U-boot as well, which is called the SPL. Um, and so you had to choose between the two, but yeah, the two would do. Uh, the two could start kernel, and we could be happy with both. Um, yeah. And so all of that was, there was already a community involved, actually, around these SOCs when we first started. Um, and this community was called Linux Sanxi. Um, and they started around a company that was called Rumbus Tech um, during 2010, I guess. Um, and they forked off uh, in 2011, which is pretty much the time I joined. Um, and so it's, very active. Um, there's a lot of people on IRC on the mailing list. Um, but there's only a few very active developers. So it's like 10 of us or something like that. So it's still a lot because they're all hobbyists and everything. They do that on their spare time. There's no company behind them, but still. Um, and so basically, they just work on whatever they see fit. So for example, some of us are working on the u boot. Um, some of us are working on the DPU reverse engineering, for example. Um, others are working on the GPU itself. Um, it really depends on what you are interested in. We don't really have an agenda there. We just aim at making it better. Um, there's kind of an issue with them as well, is that they're not always very reasonable, um, in the sense that they want to support everything with free software and everything, which is a good goal but it's not always reasonable, like I was saying. So for example, all these new SOCs will be just not supported um, because they have a power of the RGPU, which is considered evil. Um, so they just, want, just don't, want, don't want to support it. Um, yeah, Which is a bit of a shame if you ask me, but anyway. Um, but still, they achieved some very interesting things uh, which allowed us to go further. So for example, they documented the SOC and the hardware, even though we didn't have very nice uh, documentation like you might have some from, from other vendor. 
the documented the BSP that our winner was giving as well. Um, they maintain their own version of Linux, their own version of Uboot, like we saw. They bring up some distributions as well. So you had, for example, Android or Debian or Ubuntu and everything running on your hardware directly, uh, which was something that was not done by our winner. Um, yeah, and so one of these achievements, like I was saying, is maintenance of Linux, which might seem a bit a bit redundant with what we did for the maintain from the mainlining. But actually, what they went for is that the release process of a new SOC for a winner was basically just dump tarball on their website, and that's it. And so this tarball was just supporting a single uh, SOC from them, and that's it. So you had to switch from one tarball to another if you wanted to support two different SOCs, even though there was some very minor difference between them. Um, and so one of the things they did is to gather all this source code and unify all of that, if you want, consolidate all of the code, fix the bugs that they could find. So it's basically what they basically went for, maintaining the all winner code, uh, cleaning it up and everything, and yeah. But they always stuck with 3.4. They never updated the kernel because there's like a huge ton of patches on top of it. Um, and it's a very long process to upgraded to a new kernel version. So they never went for that. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of a disadvantage from this uh, community because um, even though they spend a huge amount of effort to maintain this code, it will only get worse because from 3.4 actually you have a lot of kernel releases that are made ever since. And whenever they wanted a new feature, they had to block port and everything. So it might have been some trivial features, but they also went for like huge feature like memory allocators and everything that were backported by some hobbyists, which are very cluful, but still it's some backport that not from the original author, so it might be bug prone. Um, but one of the things they did well is that their kernel basically have all the old winner features. So you have all the display working, all the sound working, so you can just pick your tablet, and with their help and their wiki, you can put an image on it, and it will work just as well, even better. Um, so it's something that's really great, but it's only, yeah, it's a version that is stuck in the past, and they will, or it will always have a lot of uh, burden that will add on it. Um, and so it's not, they were not involved at all in the mainlining that have could help them to reduce that burden. And so this is when we first started. Um, so we came in and we started to mainline, take all this code that we, that they already maintained a bit, I've fixed some bugs and everything. And then we already started to mainline this code so that um, the burden from this community would reduce over time. Um, um, so it first started in late 2011, so yeah, a bit less than a year. The first release that has some support was the 3.8.1. Um, and it was not doing much at the time. It basically just booted Linux up to an initram FS, so it didn't have any storage device or supported on everything. It just had the UART, the interrupts, a timer, and that's it. Um, but and on a single SOC, but we added more SOCs quite quickly and more features quite quickly as well. Um, and if you look at the contributions, I, well, I first started it in 3.8, which is in the left, and so you can see the amount of contributions going up, but also the number of contributors going up as well. So we are like four or five very active nowadays, um, all interested in different aspects of the kernel, but still, it, gains some traction and it's quite nice. Um, yeah, so mainly th these days we have Hans de Gude that is working for Red, Hat, for Red Hat and I guess he was aiming at working on Fedora running on the old winner resources and manage that, uh, which has been doing an amazing job, for example, at having the MMC driver working. Um, Chen Yu these days is mostly involved in the bring up of the new SOCs. Um, he lives in Taiwan, if I remember correctly, so he has like early access to the hardware um, and he works quite well on it. Um, 
yeah, Emilio is working on the clock, uh, clock patches and everything. So it's like a small amount of people, but we are doing quite fine. Um, and so what we did basically is either, yeah, two things. Um, the first one was to rewrite most of the patch of the drivers that were not done by all winner because it was some new subsystem that were introduced. Um, and so we had basically no drivers for it. So it was, for example, the clock drivers, the mixing drivers, the DMA drivers, mostly. Um, then we had to move away from FX to the device tree um, to be able to merge it into the kernel um, because obviously the kernel would not uh, take into account FX and would like to have it to have some code at least using it. Um, then we had to do some cleanup to do. And then probably the longest part uh, is to get the code accepted. So publishing it, having reviews, um, posting new versions and everything to the relevant maintainers. Um, and so <coughs> this part is actually quite generic. I mean, apart from the fix thing, uh, if you ever want to take any vendor code or your code as well, you will have to go through these steps mostly. Um, and something, yeah, usual. Um, but as part of moving away from FEX to DT, uh, we felt like there was some issues with it because we couldn't um, boot the kernel anymore on any tablet that was out there. And it was something that the Linux NC guys were really liking about it is that since you had FEX that was passed directly by the bootloader, you could boot it on any tablet and the kernel was actually working without any effort. And we were kind of losing that by switching away from FEX to DT because we had to write first a new device tree, which is not always kind of easy to do for someone that is not used to writing these files. Um, and so we came up with uh, a solution that was called Babelfish. Um, which is basically a runtime fax to dt trans translator, um, which will behave like an old all winner kernel, uh, but will embed both um, the main device trees from the platforms, um, the kernel, the real mainline kernel image in it, and will take the fax data and generate a device tree from the skeleton and from the fax file, pass it to the kernel, uh, to the mainline kernel, and boot the kernel after that. Um, which is working great. Uh, the thing is, we have kind of a bootstrap problem with it at the moment because, well, no one wants to test it uh, because there's not enough features. And since there's not enough features, uh, no one wants to develop on it and everything. So it's, yeah, a bootstrapping issue. But it's kind of a good legacy solution, I believe. Um, and so it works just like that. Uh, you have a new image, which is kernel image for your boot, um, which is very usual. Um, so you have first the UMH header, and then you have the Babelfish code, a few device with skeletons. After that, the kernel image. And so whenever the kernel is booted, it will look into the fix, choose which skeleton is appropriate for the board, um, and start working on it, um, modifying it, and then booting the kernel. And you have a mainline kernel booting on a legacy platform. Um, yeah. So it's something that is yeah quite nice too. Um, and so after a few releases, um, so 10 of them almost now, um, we were quite, um, quite far in the mainlining process now. Uh, we have all the core stuff working. So all the clock drivers, all the mixing, pin mixing and everything is working. Um, the only thing that is missing is a DMA uh, for the older resources, but there are some patches that have been sent, so it's just in the reviewing process, so it should land quite soon, hopefully. Um, and actually, since it's something that is quite cheap uh, and with very modern CPUs as well, um, some guy from Xen and ARM with KVM and everything started working on the virtualization part as well. So you have all the latest fanciness in ARM with yeah, Xen and KVM working on it, um, even with the SMP um, that is supposed to be handled by PSCI here. You have all the networking that is working as well. Um, you have some storage devices that are supported too these days, which were not the case in the beginning. So you have SATA and, MM and MMC that is working. And there's some patches. Yeah, no, it's not MMC that is pending. It's the NERM. 
yes, yeah, some flash is supposed to be handled um, by a page that is as well in the reviewing process. So you have pretty much all that is needed to for a headless device these days. Um, the only thing that is missing is, well, the user facing side. So all the display, sound, and everything is working. And it's something that is not very fortunate because it's also the f most, uh, uh, the hardest part to support in a kernel um, and the more, most complex uh, controllers in the system. But yeah, there's some work on it. There's some sound drivers that have been posted as well and have been worked on by a Google Summer of Code student during this, during this summer. So it's pending as well. And the display, well, we don't really know who it is, but there's some guy that is supposed to be working on it, but we never had any news, so yeah, we'll see. Um, and so what nec what's next now? Um, the first thing that we would like to have is some usage of our code by all winner, and that already started. So in their latest BSPs, which they're still based on 3.4, they started to grab some of our drivers to move to the standard frameworks we are talking about. For example, they took all pin controls or pin maxing drivers, uh, all clock driver as well. Um, and so it's actually a good thing. They start to move to standard API as well on their own, which is another good thing. For example, they switch to DMA engine for the DMA by themselves. Um, they switch to ASOC for the audio uh, card as well. Um, but they are still using FEX. Um, and hopefully it's something that I really like to happen is that they drop FEX in favor of device three, but I don't see that happening in like even the next years. Um, and it's something interesting happened this year as well, is that even though they didn't acknowledge any of the mainline kernel before and everything, um, they started joining Linaro uh, this year. So which is, for those of you that don't know what Linaro is, it's a consortium based around ARM um, that federate all the ARM players, so the, all the ARM vendors and the companies that are involved in the ARM ecosystems. For example, you have Facebook in it, I guess, these days. Um, so yeah, basically every company that is willing to enhance the Linux support in the ARM, on the ARM platform. Um, yeah. And so if you want to get involved, we have a nice to-do list as well. Um, so yeah, good for you. There's only the hard work remaining. We did all the trivial parts. Uh, but yeah, we have an end that requires still some work. And the audio that is requiring some work as well. Um, all the video parts, so both the video acquisition and the video displaying, uh, and the display actually, require some work too. So if you want to get involved in this, um, go ahead. Uh, there's some work on newer resources that might be needed as well. So if you want to get some device, it's actually quite trivial to, to do these days. And it's something that is um, very nice um, because, for example, in the latest kernel release, in the single release, we've been able to bring up the mainline kernel on a new SOC that was not supported before. And just building up on what we did so far, we just, yeah, it, it's not working and it's just like that. So it's something that is really nice. And for example, I updated the slides uh, last Friday and I was saying that the AAT is not supported. And this weekend, some guy started running it. And now the AAT, uh, there's some patches at least for the AAT to work. And it took like, it takes like 10 patches or something like that. And it's working already pretty well. Uh, so it's something that's really nice about mainline is that you have a lot of consolidation. And when you first uh, started and you have some drivers working, it's quite nice to build up new platforms on top of it. Um, and it's really something that you should consider as well. Um, and yeah, if you want to join, uh, feel free to yeah buy a new board and some patches. Um, but there's also been some lessons learned in the process. So I was doing that mostly on, as a hobbyist. Um, but whenever you are an hobbyist, you kind of try to rush things because you spent like some part of your holidays of your weekend working on something and yeah, you think it's working quite well and then you submit your patches and you have no answer from the maintainer and it's kind of frustrating, but it's okay. I mean, the maintainers are human being, like you were saying. Um, and, 
And basically, it's it's okay to wait. It can be in holiday or anything. Um, yeah. Um, something I learned kind of the hard way as well is that I start I have the tendency to start from scratch at the beginning always, and it's not something that works that well with more complicated ISPs. So you might want to also consider cleaning up your work instead of rewriting it from scratch. Um, it's kind of tricky to know when doing one or the other, but it's something that you also learn. Um, documentation is very important as well when you work on hardware. Uh, some vendor doesn't provide any kind of documentation. It's a pain. Um, our winner isn't really the best player here, but we still have some, so it's something. Um, um, yeah, something that is quite important as well is that you don't want to be alone in there. Um, also, because you have a lot of hardware that's coming out, uh, you can't test on everything, so having more people involved implies testing it on more hardware, but also because people can just pick up your work whenever you leave it for some reason, or work on other things while you are busy doing something else, and it's something that is very nice as well. Um, yeah, I guess that's all for me. So if you have any questions. Yeah. Do you know any kind of front vendor that does this stuff well from the beginning? Does that the stuff what? Sorry. Do you know any front vendor that does this stuff properly from the beginning? Because it's sometimes you have to start screening the market, you have to work basically, and you have to retire some stuff to make it work. Yeah, it's not something that you should it's not realistic to expect any vendor to have anything in the kernel tree since the beginning. Um, but, sorry? Intel, 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 yeah, well. Intel can, because they have this compatibility um, across all versions and everything. They rely on ICPI and everything. So basically, you can just end up using a kernel on an old Intel, oh no, you can use an old kernel on a new CPU and it will work. You can't expect that on an ARM CPU because basically it's just a mess. Uh, Intel standardized their platform uh, very heavily and it's something that's really great for them because yeah, you have hardware that is coming in and it just works. Uh, but in the ARM space, it's just chaos and it's something that ARM benefited benefit from, actually, because basically anyone can do anything, starting from, for example, Qualcomm just basically license the instruction set and design their own CPU and everything, up until some, I don't know, like most of the Chinese SOCs are just buying IPs from ARM, putting them together and shipping it, so it's kind of standardized that way, but you have the whole range of SOCs in between, so it's um, yeah, it requires much more effort because no one has the same interrupt controller, no one has the same uh, Ethernet controller, for example. Um, or if they do, um, basically it will be mapped at another address or anything. So yeah, it's really a mess. Um, but there are some ARM SOCs that works quite well at doing this. Um, for example, Atmail is really great at doing so. Um, for the last... SOC, uh, actually they announced the SOC and at the same time they said, okay, most of our patches have been sent already, uh, like half of them have been merged, so if you want to be SP, yeah, just pick up mainline, plus a few pending patches and, and that works. And some are, are really bad at it, uh, like pretty much all the, all, the, all the Chinese one, which are, which is not because they are Chinese or anything, but it's mostly young companies, so they didn't learned it, um, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, yeah, you, can, you can't really compare it to, to, to x86 in this world. So, yeah, it's not very realistic to ask that from a norm vendor because plus they have, like they like to shuffle things around every new generation, add new controllers and everything, so you have to add new drivers and a lot of them but it's something that every company should be involved in, at well, least. Yeah. 
But it, yeah, but the, the time to market these guys have um, is like from a year, they have been starting the design, written the code, and shipped into product. So it's not, given the time that it takes to merge things mainline, um, and again, I don't want to discourage you from doing so, but it's something that is not realistic. You should, something you should do is start this mainline effort, but you can't expect it to have it all merged whenever you sh you're shipping the product. It just can't work. Yeah. I think it's important to mention that uh, the most of uh, the product code in BSP is actually a bit common yeah. of Plus that, that yeah. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The. Their all engineers contacted me. Um, well, as soon as 3.8 uh, went out, so they just noticed my work and they sent an email. Um, so they have like, I can send them an email uh, asking more specific questions about their hardware and how it works and everything. So it works. Um, we we are in, in touch. Um, they do welcome our contributions because they took some drivers as well. And they sent me some hardware too to work on, but yeah, it's pretty pretty much it so far. But I'm hopeful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, we're not paid for it. No, no, it's not the customers. It's very well. I, I first started it because I was jealous of other colleagues doing the same thing and I wanted to do the same thing so I just picked some hardware that was cheap and I started working on it and it's still the case. Yes? Um, so, um, we do have SMP working. Um, it's true that it requires some secure privileges, um, but actually the bootloader starts us in the secure mode, so we can j just do that in the kernel and that's fine. So it's something that's very convenient in this case, yeah. Uh, we don't have such support yet. It should be trivial to implement, uh, but no one worked on it so far. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, the mainlining of uh, all this code uh, will uh, uh, improve the reusability of component parts uh, by the end of the If you say, for example, if we have any uh, SOC, uh, the reasons uh, we don't need to do more or not more, Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know. I know, well, in this case, I've noticed that they tend to move away from their specific parts uh, to generic uh, or um, licensed vendor IPs. Uh, so for example, they had um, a custom made interrupt controller, they moved to ARM. Um, they had um, their own Ethernet controller, they moved to the Designware one, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's a trend for them as well. Um, because, well, not only on the software side, but I guess on the hardware side, it just makes sense. So yeah, I guess. I hope so. It will be easiest for us. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess no more questions?
I think we are done then. Thanks a lot. Thank you.